Hi guys, uh, welcome. This is module CM4269, Green and Sustainable Chemistry. And this lecture is on industrial waste treatment. Um, okay, I'm hoping we can do this in one, but I might have to split it in two. Um, here is our uh, way we're gonna run this module. For reading, um, Lancaster is good. I've put a specialist reference by Heck et al. Actually uh, supporting material on the website. And we're mostly going to talk about um, liquids and gases in this lecture. So industrial effluents, which are liquids or gases. Um, the last part of this uh, physical methods is going to be very short, but it seemed the lecture will be incomplete unless I at least uh, mentioned them. Okay, let's begin. Okay, so industrial waste. Um, please be introduced to a power station. Um, it's Cotton, it's about 50 miles north of Nottingham. It's sort of between Nottingham and Manchester in the UK. So, what waste streams can you see from this picture and which are the most serious? Okay, well, we've certainly got atmospheric gases uh, coming out of this and this lots atmospheric particulates as well. Now, I don't know if you can see, but there's a river there. Uh, this is a fossil power station, so there'll be riverine inputs. Um, if there are riverine inputs, it's likely that there'll be aquifer inputs. And of course, what goes up must come down. All of these, uh, certainly the smoke here, uh, it is going to some that's going to get down onto the ground, so particulates to the soil. They're all examples of industrial waste uh, or waste streams, but they're not actually impacts. As it turns out, most of the squat pepper pot um, things are coolers. And actually most of what's coming out of those, in fact, all of what's coming out of those are simply steam. Uh, this chimney is probably the only real source of atmospheric pollution in this picture. But we'll talk about chimneys and stuff like that a bit later. Um, okay, so we're talking about waste streams and industrial waste. Let's actually think about um, what these streams are. Okay, here's a couple of uh, definitions. A waste stream is a component of the complete flow of waste from a process area or sector um, through to final disposal. The intervention of recycling may act to lessen the size of the stream. Sector, okay, it might mean uh, something like domestic waste. Um, it might be a physical area like the west of the city or in Singapore, the west of the island where most of the industry is, west and south of the island where most of the industry is. Um, I'd like you to think of waste streams in this lecture a bit like you've been thinking in your process diagrams as flows. Either you can think of it as pipes in a, a chemical plant or rivers or streams of waste, whatever uh, you feel. Um, I should also say that most of this lecture we are going to be looking at what are called end of pipe solutions. In an ideal world you recycle, you reuse, and you reduce the amount of waste to the minimum possible if you can't recycle it all. But there is a remainder. And to deal with this, you either have to have an end of pipe solution 
to actually treat the waste before it gets out into the environment or you take it away and landfill it. Okay, let us proceed. Okay, here is a process, a sector, call it what you will. Uh, an example might be the power station now picture. And here are the waste streams from that power station. We have an atmospheric waste stream, which will have particles, chemical material, gases in that stream. You have a, not a waster, a liquid waste stream with has physical heat as a property. So it could be warming the river or the lake and chemical material in it. And a solid waste stream, which again is chemical material. Now, all of these waste streams have impacts. Um, and to know what these are, we think back to the last lecture or the lecture before, you'd think about doing a life cycle analysis. You would think carefully about how far you wanted to take that analysis, where the boundaries were, and um, then identify the impacts within those parameters. Um, I'm not going to talk particularly about impacts in this lecture. Um, it sort of is read that a waste stream is extremely unlikely not to have some sort of impact, be it a warmer river, be it eutrophication of waters, be it whatever. Okay, so we're not going to particularly think about um, what the impacts are. You'd use a life cycle analysis. Um, normally impact on human and animal life is explicit. The types of impacts we would uh, also have from um, certainly the power station would be these here. So atmospheric particulates and gases impact surface water, soils and plants and so on and so forth through here. As I said, how many impacts, the degree and on what of the, that uh, stream impacts, you can see as you want because you're going to set the boundaries. Usually the ones you have to really think about and act on are the ones that um, affect most people. Now most impacts affect people. Usually if you've got more than maybe 10 significant impacts you might want to rethink the process. Anyway we're not going to talk any more about um, uh, impacts. We're now going to, to focus on uh, waste management. Now what are the goals of waste treatment? Uh, well, waste management planning minimise the generation and impacts of waste. We've already talked about this in earlier lectures. Waste is a resource in the wrong place. To have to treat waste means you're basically throwing money into a big black pit. Waste management is the prevention, the characterisation, the monitoring, the treatment, the handling, the reuse, and the residual deposition of waste or wastes. Um, and waste treatment is minimizing the volume and impact of waste. So if this lecture is about um, industrial waste streams, your first order of action is actually to minimize those waste streams. If I wanted to say it in short words, I might say plan, manage, and then treat. Um, we'll continue here for a moment, and then we're going to have a very quick look at the legislative system for dealing with pollutants. Because clearly, you can't break the law. Okay, um, in
in the past, there were many, many different bodies dealing with different aspects of pollution. So if you want to go right back, and I'm thinking in the UK, because uh, Singapore has taken a lot of its legislative framework from the UK, so it's reasonably valid. Go back to the 1700s, you had an alkali inspectorate, sorry, the 1800s, you had an alkali inspectorate, and they inspected your premises to see whether you were discharging acids or alkalis. Um, and that was the pattern. You had hundreds of different bodies, government, local authority, regulatory bodies, who were concerned about um, smoke, maybe, or were concerned about navigation of rivers, and pollution had been dumped onto them as well. Um, that situation is problematic from either an enforcement or a policy perspective. If you have hundreds of agencies, the alkaline spectra, the water boards, um, and it goes on and on and on, they're unconnected and disjointed from each other. So, first of all, that's neither efficient nor effective. But more to the point, if the idea is protecting the environment, if you've got a whole, a whole body of different organisations are not talking to each other, then actually, in terms of the environment, it's not going to be very useful either. Okay, the milestone is something called Integrated Pollution Control, IPC. Now, in the UK, the Environmental Protection Act 1990 wasn't the main act, but it first began the process of gathering these little agencies up together. Um, they had the alkali um, inspectorate, they had the factory inspectorate, they had the industrial emissions inspectorate. A whole group of these small agencies were gathered together uh, under the 1990 Act to begin to give force and reality to this idea of integrated pollution control, the whole big picture. Now, in 1995, the main enabling act, the Environment Act in the UK, was passed. And this was the main tranche of bringing things together uh, in terms of integrated pollution control. Uh, the Environment Act, it changed or otherwise modified about 65 other Acts of Parliament, um, typically rationalising, transferring powers or authorities to this new body that the Environment Act formed, which was called the Environment Agency. And the Environment Agency became very much a template for modern pollution uh, control and environmental management. Um, so now in the UK, the Environment Agency is the central consenting and enforcement authority around the whole environment. They can actually call the police and take the police with them and arrest people. So they are right the way from policy regulation, right the way through to enforcement. And you no longer have the 50 million tiny organisations, you just have one joined up and efficient organisation to um, uh, basically manage the environment. And on the right, there's a little uh, graphic really just underlining the joined up process um, from basically regulation, policy and regulation, right the way through to planning, management and monitoring. Okay, what we're going to do now is go on to the characterization of waste streams. Now, to be able to fully treat any waste stream, it sounds very obvious, you need to know what it is. 
Now, we're going to start with liquids. Um, and with liquid waste, it's true for any waste, but um, liquid waste is the, uh, the most obvious one in one sense. Once you know what's com what it comprises of, what's in it, then you need to decide how you're going to treat it and who's going to treat it. Um, you can sell it, maybe if it could be seen as a resource for somebody else or a feedstock, excellent, then you get paid for it. Or can it not either easily be turned into or is not a valuable feedstock, in which case you have to pay. Now, are you going to do this? Because if you do it, at least then nobody else knows about your dirty washing. That is, they don't know what it is your waste stream is all about. And that can be commercially sensitive uh, information. It's usually cheaper to treat it yourself, but it also requires you to extend your operations. You need know-how and the on cost. Uh, you basically increase your capital burden. You can contract it out to a specialist and then it's actually their problem, not your problem, because when they buy the waste from you or um, uh, when you uh, give it to them in terms of money for a contract, it's then their waste and that's okay for you. But of course, information leaks, um, they will then be able to analyze and know exactly what your waste is. You could, on the other hand, simply sit back and discharge it to the sewer. It still needs to be a certain standard, and we'll talk a bit about that later. Um, but the likelihood is there are quite serious limitations on what you can put in the sewer, and the likelihood is it will cost you probably a lot more than if you put it out to a specialist. Okay, so first lesson is you need to know what's in the effluent or the waste stream and then you need to know how you're going to deal with it. Well, these are the types of issues you'd think about um, whether you're going to do it yourself or contract it out. The most or one of the most important things is the classification of the waste. There is a waste classification which you need to know about. The uh, most expensive of which and the most demanding classification is hazardous waste. If your waste is classed as hazardous waste, then actually this is a waste of time, <laughs> forgive the pun. The decision is a waste of time because it's then under regulation, which means that you have to landfill it, you can't send it out to anybody else. Um, but for most situations, you get the choice at this point. You can decide whether to treat the waste further so it becomes non-hazardous or whatever. Anyway, let's continue on our merry way. So, let's think for a moment about the order in which uh, you need to think about treatment. And we're talking about liquids. Preliminary treatment. That's to protect any processes, chemical, biological, or um, physical, that you are going to uh, apply to this waste. So most water treatment systems uh, have a preliminary stage. The Second um, stage of any treatment is anaerobic sedimentation, which is a bi obviously a biological uh, treatment system. The next stage is secondary treatment, which is aerobic, again, uh, biological treatment. And then finally, you may find it called tertiary, or you may find it called advanced. There's other treatments. Um, some um, uh, legislatures 
uh, choose to in include disin uh, disinfection into advanced some tend to include it in secondary we're not too really worried there but the um, tertiary advanced treatment is the more advanced stuff it's like reducing nutrients reducing um, uh, maybe the amount of organics in the water and things like that uh, what we'll do now is we'll look at a uh, a more uh, helpful or a couple of helpful diagrams so this is I apologize for the quality of this this is the first of these diagrams so we have preliminary that was the protection stuff and basically in a typical waterworks that's screening out the the dead fish the lumps of tree uh, the tampons the things that people throw down the toilet and they shouldn't uh, to protect downstream processes and there's some grit removal um, there are anything that will drop out basically and I'll leave to your imagination what that might include in a sewage works then we get the primary treatment which is a uh, sedimentation and um, then uh, it's anaerobic so there's uh, there's not oxygen in there it's it's happening um, without oxygen and you may choose to disinfect and release your effluent at that point certainly in most modern um, legislatures that's not possible you won't have the quality you need here but it depends what's in your waste stream if your waste stream is not sewage as such but maybe it's uh, some particular specific um, chemical waste stream your treatment here sedimentation could deal with it um, but it's likely that you wouldn't be discharging this to the environment you'd then be passing it on to a specialist obviously sedimentation sediment uh, the results of that go into your sludge treatment if you're continuing with treatment and the vast majority will you then have uh, what's called a, a oxidative or aerobic treatment and uh, typically you have the large round sewage trickling filters here um, it basically allows uh, aerobic organisms to work on what the anaerobes from the primary have left and again you've got the choice of discharging again it won't be to the environment it won't be clean enough and of course you produce more sediment which goes into your sludge which you then dispose of or sell now at that point you've done your primary and secondary water treatment the tertiary or advanced stage there's a number of examples here phosphorus removal nitrogen removal suspended solids removal typically here um, the, the box actually isn't in here but there's a box in here called polishing typically that involves ultraviolet light and it involves uh, maybe hydrogen peroxide or it might involve ozone is more usual um, and that removes organics it oxidizes them pretty much completely and um, also acts as a major disinfection sterilization route and for most certain European Union uh, water treatment works that is now the standard for discharge um, and they often generate some of their own power from methane to, to actually generate the electricity to run those stations. And that often means, it's quite ironic really, you measure the quality of water in the sewage dis discharge, in the water treatment plant discharge. The water quality is probably better than that of the river you're putting it into. I'll tell you a grim little story. Um, there are a series of towns and cities going down the River Thames in the UK, in England, through London and out. 
I lived in London for, I was born actually just outside London, but I actually lived in London. I did my PhD there for four years. And it was not comforting to think that the water I ran from the tap when I went to gl a glass of water, on average had gone through 14, one four other people on its route from the head of the Thames right down to where I was in the city of London. Um, been drunk, through sewage, cleaned, back in the river, abstracted again, and round and round. However, this type of treatment, especially with the polishing, is very, very effective indeed. Um, so although it sounds like a grim joke, um, it's actually really quite doable. I could give you other examples, but, uh, but I won't. Okay, and this is what it might look like uh, picturesquely. Um, again, you've got your preliminary treatment. And here in this diagram, your preliminary has been bulked with your primary. So you've got your filters there. Then you've got your sand and grit removal. And then you have your first, the primary process, the anaerobic digestion to sewage to sludge. It goes on with an aerobic digestion in the secondary stage, more sludge. And when you've got sludge from an aerobic process, it's usually called activated sludge. And then finally, here they have disinfection and they've got chlorination actually. Um, ultraviolet light, which is their polishing for discharge. And their tertiary advance, they've got nutrient removal. But as I said, that can be in either, either of them. Um, okay, I think we've done that one to death. Right, in a typical waste stream, what will be the things that are likely to need attention? Okay, the biological oxygen demand, and I'll talk about what that is in a moment, the chemical oxygen demand, the total organic carbon, the total colour, total salts, that's the conductivity, and the pH, and it may contain other regulated substances, metals or compounds, which you'd also need to clean up to a specification. Now that specification will be given to you. If you're in Europe, it's the European Water Directive, um, and in whatever uh, jurisdiction you are, uh, there will be an appropriate set of standards that you need to clean your effluent up to. What are all these uh, parameters? Well, biological oxygen demand is actually a biological test and it's a measure of how much oxygen biological organisms would use up if they had to munch on your effluent. Um, so if you're thinking of um, anoxia in rivers, uh, you have to keep the biological oxygen demand low so that you don't actually remove all of the oxygen from the river and then kill everything in the river. The chemical oxygen demand is the non-biological um, measure and uh, usually the BOD is about 80-85% of the COD. Total organic carbon is yet another measure of carbon for water quality, usually you're interested in um, BOD, COD, and TOC. But for completeness, total colour, if your effluent is bright pink, or I'll give you an Oxford example of uh, a general foods plant, a Banbury in Oxfordshire, used to make uh, instant coffee, and its effluent was the colour of coffee. Um, we actually did work on them for that and resolved that problem for them because now in Europe, if your effluent is more coloured than a, a certain standard, you pay for the water company to decolour it. We actually developed a very nice little precipitation system which cleaned the colour out of their effluent and actually quite a lot of the um, oxygen demand as well, so they were well happy. Um, pH, you might need to make sure that the pH is... Uh, within uh, limits. Conductivity, that's uh, a slightly more difficult one 
because much wastewater does have a background concentration of salts in it. Um, so typically you're using iron exchange resins to strip those out and other um, uh, substances which would require chemical treatment to get out. Right. What sorts of other treatments? Distillation, very energy hungry. Steam stripping, where you run steam through uh, whatever uh, you're trying to dispose of. Filtration, um, centrifugation. There's a whole list of physical treatments which you can invoke to bring your uh, effluent to whatever the local standards are. There are effectively three types of treatment obviously physical chemical and biological that probably sorts the physical ones out we'll now go on to chemical so given that we've got effluent and we need to treat it in some way what typically are the types of chemical treatment that we might employ well neutralization oxidation metal removal chemical reduction or electrochemical. Um, now I know we've also already looked at some biological oxidation and reduction in terms of water treatment but these are chemical um, oxidations and reductions. Okay so what, what might we do? Well if the pH is very different from whatever the uh, standard is that you have to get to you can neutralize either acid or base what are the pros and cons of that? Well, the pros are that then your waste meets that particular requirement. Your cons are it increases the waste volume and potentially increases the salt content. It can be potentially green, um, but it may add extra steps in your treatment of your um, industrial waste stream. Okay, what else can you do? Well, maybe it's not pH that's the problem, but it's uh, redox potential or speciation. You could oxidize, and this is green chemistry, so you're not going to stuff in manganese oxide or something like that. You're going to use hydrogen peroxide or um, ozone. They're effective uh, for uh, oxidations. They're not necessarily massively fast but they're effective at quite low levels so uh, they're useful oxidizing agents and of course they're reasonably green. Uh, you might try wet air oxidation but if you're going to do that air oxidation is a lot slower than hydrogen peroxide or ozone you're going to have to up the temperature or you're going to have to use pressure but this is good for difficult pollutants, polyphenols, pesticides. Effectively, you generate hydroxyl radical um, in the solution, which is a very powerful um, oxidizing system. Um, you can also uh, use pre-programmed -pre -pre a pre-programmed oxidant sequence and you can assist it with UV. This is now getting into serious league oxidation. Once you're putting UV in, you've got radical chemistry, you've got singlet and doublet oxygen. Um, you've got a lot of oxidation going on. Finally, you can use supercritical water, which we uh, may talk about later. As with other parts of the course, there are suitable catalysts you can also use but you have to use catalysts you can get out again. Um, so typically cerium or ruthenium solid supported oxidation catalysts can be used in conjunction with um, most of these types of oxidation methods. Okay, let's carry on through. What else is there? Well, there's metal removal. If you've got um, a lot of metals in there then maybe what you might want to do is 
to use, there are a couple of ways of reducing metals. What you might want to do is use an electrochemical cell. Um, so effectively, very much for chromium-6, which is a very nasty pollutant, uh, you might want to do a, first of all, homogenous redox reaction with uh, a ferrous salt, which will um, reduce your chromium-6 to chromium-3, which is relatively harmless compared to chromium-6. Um, you can precipitate a sulfides or carbonates, or you can electrochemically uh, clean uh, your eluent, uh, eluent, your effluent. Uh, so this is particularly useful when you've got quite valuable um, uh, metals in solution. Uh, most companies prefer to do this themselves because most metals are actually quite expensive. And particularly if you've got an electroplating works, then this type of method is uh, very useful and very cost effective. So um, you can do this electrolytically with the cell that we just talked about, um, or you could do it uh, chemically, but you would typically use, um, you would want to do this for recovering gold, silver, um, palladium, nickel, cadmium, cobalt, and the like. Um, and again, um, a couple of examples. You can use, using that uh, cell system, you can reduce organics as well, should you wish to. So chlorophenols particularly, use tin oxide coated anodes and you can reduce uh, many things because you've got the uh, hydroxide ion, uh, sorry, the hydroxyl radical actually on the electrode. Um, and uh, obviously um, with any electrochemical cell system you have potentially mass transport limitations. So you need to think if your effluent hasn't already got solute in it to carry charge, then you're not going to be very successful. So you'd use this sort of thing really when you've got quite valuable metals. Um, and then you're doing a, a non-green thing, you're adding solute so you get the conductivity uh, so that you can actually um, strip the metals back out again. But then of course you have to deal with the electrolytes you've added. But particularly good, this electrochemical method is particularly good for refractory organics, things that you can't get rid of any other way. Okay, we'll uh, carry on now with the um, set of treatments, the biological tranche of treatments. So here, if we're using biology, you've got to think that whatever is in your industrial waste, your waste stream, that's what the biology is going to use as food. So any organic compounds you have, they'll be digested either aerobically or anaerobically. So we looked at this in terms of a water treatment plant where um, there's all sorts of organics in there. It's exactly the same for a, um, a chemical plant which is producing organics in its effluent. Um, and again, um, in the, apps, in the presence of air, you can get quite happy aerobic oxidation. And if you have not got air there, then actually uh, you can do it uh, anaerobically uh, to get alcohols. And uh, depending on what the ions are, um, NO or H2S. Because nitrate or sulfur in this case is the electron acceptor. Whereas in the aerobic system, of course, it's oxygen, which is the, elect the electron acceptor. Okay. Um, 
usually if you've got the choice between aerobic and anaerobic um, uh, cleanup, unless there are good reasons against, um, aerobic is usually faster and more efficient. Um, but the structure of the food, that is the organic compounds in the effluent, is important. Um, this is biology working. So if you then have sterically hindered compounds that the enzymes can't get their hands around metaphorically, then it's going to be slower. Um, for aromatics, aromatics with electron donating groups are much faster than electron withdrawing groups. Um, to give you an example, I've given you uh, on the next slide the degradation path for aliphatic materials usually goes by alcohol, ketone and acid, but gives you similar intermediates. And the key thing here is that the uh, terminal uh, stages involve coenzyme A. And basically, this is a beta oxidation which chops off two carbon fragments uh, with the acetyl-CoA down the line as it goes. Um, I'll show you. And this is direct from Manahan, so it's, you can look it up yourself. Um, so, yeah, there you go. It's um, a very comfortable way of doing this, where you're um, harnessing the biological chemistry as well as the non-biological chemistry. Okay, um, the, we've got to the end now of the liquid stuff and we're going to think about flue gases. This is just a, a last slide for the first half. Uh, a power station of the future actually proposed. Um, it's a UK biomass power station, supposed to be at Teesside. And normally I'd show this slide in energy resources and we would ask questions about OK, we know we can do it, but should we and the energy density of the fuel? I'm showing it here just because uh, this particular proposal and design, and uh, there's a web link there, would have very minimal emissions. We're going to be talking more about the power station you saw on the front of the lecture, but nonetheless, um, an interesting idea. OK, I'm going to go now. So. Um, I'll see you again in a minute to continue uh, this lecture with flue gas treatments. Goodbye.